Okay, welcome back to Blood Physiology Lecture 3. So uh, this is Dr. Piri taking you in blood physiology. So, so far, there are a couple of lectures that we've had. So I hope you are appreciating the PowerPoint as well as uh, the videos that I'm uploading to Moodle. So like I said, what I'll be doing, I'll be recording a video. Then after recording this video, I'll be uploading it to Moodle so that everyone will be able to appreciate just to avoid interruption by internet connectivity. And sometimes there are students who are always coming online, offline, online, offline. So I think uh, uh, it will be more productive by me just uh, recording myself and then I post the video for you to appreciate. Okay, so like I said, this is Bad Physiology Lecture 3 and the content of uh, this lecture, we are going to look at the general function of blood physiology. And then we are also going to look at um, the red cell count. So the general function of red blood cells, not blood physiology, but the general function of red blood cells and uh, also red cell count. How can you do a red cell count? So uh, there are different uh, ways in which you can do red cell count. You have automated or you can do a manual count of red blood cells. So mainly we are going to discuss the manual count of, uh, of, of counting red blood cells and then later on we'll look at blood indices. So we are just continuing from where we ended. You remember last week we, we looked at um, erythropoiesis, so this erythropoiesis, we say that within the the red marrow, there is a cell, the hematopoietic stem cell. In this hematopoietic stem cell, we have the long-term hematopoietic stem cell that will depreciate into short-term hematopoietic stem cell. And the short-term hematopoietic stem cell is going to depreciate into multipotential progenitor cell. The multipotential progenitor cell is the one that is going to be stimulated by the uh, inducers. So there are different types of inducers. We say they are uh, growth inducers and also depreciation inducers. So once uh, that multipotential stem cell is stimulated by those inducers, it's going to depreciate into two major types of cells. It's going to depreciate into the common myeloid progenitor cell or the common lymphoid progenitor cell. But since we're looking at erythropoiesis, you know to say erythropoiesis mainly is coming from the lineage where you have the common myeloid progenitor cell. So this common myeloid progenitor cell is capable of differentiating into different types of cells. So because it's capable of uh, differentiating into different types of cells, it can give rise to uh, granulocytes. So we're talking of uh, white blood cell with granules. We have the neutrophils, the basophils, and the eosinophils. Then on top of that, it can also differentiate into monocytes. Then it can also differentiate into platelets. You know, to say the cell that is giving rise to platelets is the megakaryocyte. And then on top of that, the red blood cells is also coming from this cell. So we say the, the common myeloid stem cell or progenitor cell, it can give rise to uh, proerythroblasts. So the proerythroblast is a committed cell. So this is a committed step that will now proceed into the production or development of red blood cells. So the first one is the proerythroblast. So we said all the cells that are ending with a blast, these are called committed cells. So you know all these that are ending with a blast, they are committed cell. So the cell that is committed to become a red blood cell is called proerythroblast. And then later on there, the, the cytoplasm of this cell will become uh, eosinophilic or basophilic, not eosinophilic, to become basophilic. So <clears throat> this cell will later on change its name to uh, basophilic uh, erythroblast. So basophilic erythroblast is because of the basophilic cytoplasm to appear blue as this cell is developing. And then with those factors, it's going to differentiate into another cell so once you have this basophilic erythroblast, you know to say that there are ribosomes that are being produced in there, and then the ribosomes are the ones that are involved in the synthesis of um, 
proteins. So the information is coming from the nucleus of this particular cell. That's why you still have a nucleus as it, as at this point of a red blood cell development or erythropoiesis. So the nucleus has got the uh, DNA. So there's DNA transcription into a messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA <coughs> will contain now uh, the message that is required for the protein synthesis, the proteins that are necessary for the red blood cell. And this protein is talking about the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin, you have the polypeptide chain as part of the hemoglobin. So you need a lot of ribosomes that are going to translate the messenger RNA into the polypeptide chains. And then the polypeptide chains will be associated with uh, the heme. The heme, this is where you find the ion attaching to the heme group for the production of hemoglobin. So because now at this stage, where you have more production of uh, hemoglobin, the color of the cytoplasm of this cell will start changing from basophilic erythroblast, then it will, it will become polychromatophilic erythroblast. So you have polychromatophilic erythroblast, meaning that now there's accumulation of uh, hemoglobin, then the, the cytoplasm is becoming more of eosinophilic. Then from there, it will differentiate into orthochromatophilic erythroblast. The orthochromatophilic erythroblast is the one now that will get rid of the nucleus. So there will be ejection of the nucleus. And then uh, after the nucleus is ejected, at this time, you are also losing the ribosomes because now the hemoglobin has been uh, produced in good quantities for a normal red blood cell. So you get rid of the ribosomes or the RNA. You're also getting rid of the DNA, which is the nucleus. <clears throat> and then at the same time, you're also getting rid of the mitochondria. Because remember, the red blood cell is meant to carry oxygen. So it doesn't need to have much of the mitochondria. Otherwise, it will start using that oxygen that is supposed to be carried to the tissue. So you find that at this point in time, the cell at this level, at orthochromatophilic erythroblast, it will now lose all those cell organelles so that it's loaded with a lot of hemoglobin for the function of oxygen transportation and carbon dioxide, as you will appreciate later on when you start looking in detail, the functions of red blood cells. The reticulocyte <coughs> is slightly bigger than the red blood cell or mature red blood cell. Then it will enter the bloodstream from the bone marrow via a process which is called diapedesis. So diapedesis is a movement of these reticulocytes from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. So they're going to squeeze itself in between the endothelial cells to go into uh, the capillaries and then it will join the circulation like that. So the reticulocyte will now mature to the red blood cell. So either the reticulocyte or the mature red blood cell will undergo diapedesis to move from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. So you have the production of red blood cell. It's done. Now, what are the general functions of red blood cells and also the red cell count and blood indices? So this is the purpose of this class. So let's start. <clears throat> Starting with the major functions of red blood cells. So there are basically four major functions of red blood cell. So the first one is to transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissue. So you know to say that gaseous exchange is taking place within the lungs. So in the alveoli, you have a higher partial pressure of oxygen compared to uh, pulmonary capillaries. So uh, oxygen will be able to move from the alveoli into the, the bloodstream. So then when it moves, when it diffuses into the bloodstream, then it will bind with hemoglobin. Then hemoglobin will carry that oxygen to the tissue. So the first major function of red blood cell is to transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissue so that the tissues will be able to access the oxygen and use it for the production of ATP. And you know to say adenosine triphosphate is a form of energy that our cells are using to carry out a lot of metabolism. So you need this oxygen. So that's where the red blood cell comes in to carry that oxygen to the tissues. At the same time, there are a lot of metabolic waste products that are coming from the cells. When the cells undergo metabolism, there are waste products that are coming from there. For instance, you have the production of carbon dioxide that is coming from the Krebs cycle. So this carbon dioxide needs to be carried back to the lungs so that it can be exchanged for oxygen. That's where gaseous exchange takes place. 
So now, part of these uh, red blood cells will carry now the oxygen, uh, the carbon dioxide back to the lungs for gaseous exchange. So it is a function of the hemoglobin again that can combine with, uh, with, with uh, carbon dioxide to be carried to the lungs. But remember that oxygen and carbon dioxide, they are binding to the hemoglobin quite all right, but the sites to which they bind are different. The oxygen is binding to the heme group or the hemoglobin. And the heme group is the one that contains iron. And this iron, it has to be in ferrous state. Otherwise, if it's in ferric state, that can interfere with the affinity of this hemoglobin to oxygen. So it doesn't carry much oxygen when it's in ferric state. So you need to have ferrous state of iron for it to carry oxygen. Then the other function of red blood cell, it helps in regulation of pH. So you know to say that the pH of blood needs to be maintained within the normal range. And this range is between 7.3, 7 7.35 to 7.45. That's the normal pH of blood. So this pH needs to be maintained. Why is because these cells, they operate well at optimum pH. You have enzymes that will need to operate at optimum pH. You have proteins, you have hormones. So it needs to be regulated. So the red blood cell in itself, it's also involved in the regulation of pH. How? Within the cytoplasm of uh, the red blood cell, you have the buffer systems. These buffer systems are able to pick up the hydrogen ions or to release the hydrogen ions depending on the pH of the blood. At the same time, you have the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin can also bind with hydrogen ions, which is also called a proton. So the hemoglobin can bind with the hydrogen ion, hence reducing the concentration of hydrogen ions. So depending on the pH, they can either, uh, they can either bind with much of these, uh, these hydrogen ions or they can just release them depending on the pH. If you need to, for instance, if you need to increase the pH of blood, then the hemoglobin has to bind more of the protons or more of the hydrogen ions so that the concentration of hydrogen ions reduces. And you know to say, once the concentration of hydrogen ions are reducing the pH, it's becoming alkaline, so it will go up. So if the pH of blood is becoming more acidic, the opposite will take place. Here now, the hemoglobin will start releasing those hydrogen ions into circulation, then the concentration of hydrogen ions will start increasing. Once you have an increase in hydrogen ions, then the pH will start reducing. So that's how the hemoglobin is involved in pH regulation. Then the other function is to provide necessary enzymes that convert bicarbonate into, uh, into carbon dioxide in, in the lungs. So once there's transportation of carbon dioxide, you know to say there's a certain percentage of carbon dioxide that is transported by plasma. About 70% 7, of carbon dioxide is transported in form of bicarbonate in plasma. Then you have the 23% that can bind with hemoglobin. Then you have the 5% that can just dissolve in plasma. So you have 7% of carbon dioxide as dissolved carbon dioxide in plasma for transportation. The 23% can bind with hemoglobin forming the carbamino hemoglobin. And then the 70% can undergo a reaction that will give you a bicarbonate. And this bicarbonate will dissolve in plasma and then it will be transported. So once it gets to the lungs, it needs to be converted back to the carbon dioxide so that there's gaseous exchange. So how does that happen? It's because the hemoglobin, they have enzymes, carbonic and hydrase enzyme, that will be capable to convert <coughs> this bicarbonate. So the bicarbonate will undergo a reverse reaction that will result into more production of carbon dioxide. And this carbon dioxide will be released now to the lungs for gaseous exchange. So those are the major functions of red blood cell in particular. So because <clears throat> most of these functions that we've discussed here, it's attaching, it's, it's, it's related to the, the structure of the hemoglobin. It's important. So we need to understand the structure of hemoglobin so that we appreciate why uh, these red blood cells are able to carry oxygen, they are able to carry carbon dioxide, and also they are involved in pH regulation. So let's look at the, the general structure of hemoglobin. 
So the diagram here is showing the structure of hemoglobin. So this hemoglobin molecule is a tetramer consisting of two pairs of similar polypeptide chains, which are called globin. So you have these globin. So you have polypeptide chains. So you have two pairs, meaning that two are identical and the other two are also identical. So depending on the type of the hemoglobin, you have different combinations of these polypeptide chains. So in adult, for instance, we have adult hemoglobin, which is called hemoglobin A or adult hemoglobin. The combination of these polypeptide chains, you have two alpha globin chains and you have two beta globin chains. So two alpha, two beta chains. So on these chains, you have four chains. At the center of the four chains, each will have the heme group. So you can appreciate the heme group at the center of the polypeptide chain. So the heme group is the one that contains ion, and depending on the state of the ion, it's either going to combine with oxygen or not. If it's in a ferric state, when it loses three electrons, and then it's having plus two sign, then it's in ferric state, it can't bind with oxygen. So such hemoglobin won't bind with oxygen. But if it's in a um, ferrous state, ferrous state you have plus two, plus two because this ion is losing two electrons, so it will have a plus two sign, then it means it, 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 will, it will have that good affinity to bind with oxygen. So most of these hemoglobin, they have to be in ferrous state for them to bind with oxygen. So we are looking at the function of blood cells. So these components of hemoglobin will also be discussed when we start discussing um, when we start discussing respiratory system. So the respiratory system, the gases exchange is also involvement of oxygen in terms of transportation of those gases. So we'll look at this structure in detail once we start looking at respiratory system. But for now, just appreciate the structure of the hemoglobin in different types of hemoglobin that I'll be discussing with you in just a minute. <clears throat> so we're still looking at the structure of the hemoglobin. So you can see here the polypeptide chains, we have two alpha chains and two beta chains. So you have the two alpha chains and two beta chains. And then at the center, you have the heme group. And these heme group are the ones that contain iron or iron containing uh, substance within the hemoglobin. So a bit of information on the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin molecules can transport up to four oxygen molecules. So you have the hemoglobin that can combine up to a maximum of four oxygen molecules, meaning that you have four heme group. Each heme group can combine with only one oxygen. This oxygen binding occurs in response to the high partial pressure in the lungs. So what do I mean? As the red blood cells are moving within the pulmonary capillaries, these pulmonary capillaries, they have a low partial pressure of oxygen because they are carrying, they are carrying much of uh, carbon dioxide and also the hydrogen ions. So they don't have much of the oxygen. So the partial pressure is not that much compared to the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So within the alveoli, the structures, the bag-like structures, that are found within uh, the lung tissue, <clears throat> the partial pressure of oxygen is high there. Why is it? Because the air in there is almost equivalent to the percentages of, uh, of oxygen in the air outside the environment. So you find that the partial pressure there is high. So because of that high partial pressure, gases will always move from uh, higher partial pressure to low partial pressure regions. So it means that oxygen will move from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. Then once it moves there, it will bind with hemoglobin. So when four oxygen molecules are bound to the hemoglobin, it is 100% saturated. But with pure oxygen, it is partially saturated. So what it means is that once four oxygen molecules go and bind to the four heme group, then that hemoglobin is saturated. It can't take up any more oxygen because its carrying capacity is maximum now. But what you need to know is there is cooperative binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. So the more oxygen is binding, the greater the affinity between hemoglobin and oxygen. You need to understand that. So if one hemoglobin attaches, I mean, one oxygen attaches to the hemoglobin, the first one, 
then the chance for the second one to bind will increase. Why? It's because now this hemoglobin is increasing its affinity for more oxygen. The second oxygen binds to the second heme, then the, the chance of it binding with the third one will increase. Then when the third oxygen goes and binds, for it to bind with the fourth one will also increase. So this kind of binding is called cooperative binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. The more the oxygen is binding, the greater the affinity of hemoglobin towards the oxygen so that it reaches maximum in terms of transportation of this oxygen. Once you have four oxygen, then you have saturation of blood. But what you need to know is that you can never reach 100% saturation when you compare the hemoglobin attaching with oxygen. So you can't reach 100% saturation, whereby all the hemoglobin, they have the oxygen attached to them, or all the heme in the blood, they all have oxygen attached to them for, it, for them to be 100% saturated with oxygen. So that can never happen in a human being. Why? It's because you have different forms of hemoglobin. There are those that, would, that are very good at binding with oxygen, but there are those that do not interact with oxygen that much. So because of that, not all the hemoglobin will be saturated with uh, oxygen. For instance, I've already told you to say that for the heme group to interact with oxygen or to bind with oxygen, it needs to be in ferrous state. So once it's in ferric state, oxygen can't bind. Then you have other forms of uh, hemoglobin that do not interact with oxygen to that extent. For instance, you have adult hemoglobin too. The adult hemoglobin A, that's a normal hemoglobin that has got two alpha, then you have two beta polypeptide chains. But you have another form of hemoglobin, which is called adult hemoglobin 2, that will have two alpha and two delta chains. The two alpha and two delta chains do not interact with oxygen that much. So it will never reach 100% saturation. Because of that, you will find that blood will never be 100% saturated with oxygen but it can reach as high as 98% saturation. So the 98% saturation is because you know to say that the quantity of uh, adult hemoglobin A is about 98%. So all the adult hemoglobin A can combine with oxygen, so they'll reach saturation. But the 2% of other forms of hemoglobin, some of them, they don't interact with uh, oxygen that much. So it won't reach 100% saturation, but it can reach up to a maximum of 98%. <clears throat> this table here is summarizing different types of hemoglobin that you can appreciate in an adult. So as you are starting an, as an, an embryo, there are also different forms of hemoglobin that is found in an embryo. You have GOA1, hemoglobin, the GOA1 hemoglobin, that it, it has got two combinations of polypeptide chains. So you have two pairs of polypeptide chains. You have one pair, which is called a zeta. So you have two zeta and two epsilon, that is called GOA1. And this hemoglobin, it has got the greatest affinity for oxygen. So you find that as a fetus, it's able to extract oxygen from uh, the placenta, as the maternal circulation is moving in the placenta, then you find that it's able to extract that oxygen because it has got a greater affinity as compared to that of the mother or maternal circulation. Then you have fetal hemoglobin that is shown here. Okay, another type of hemoglobin that is found in the embryo, so you have GOA1 and GOA2. So GOA1 and GOA2, those are two different types of hemoglobin. The GOA2, it has got two alpha polypeptide chains and two epsilon. So those are the two different types of uh, hemoglobin that is found within 
the, the embryo. But as the embryo is converted into a fetus, even the type of the hemoglobin will also change. So in a fetus, you have hemoglobin fetus, and these will have uh, two pair of polypeptide chains. So you have two alpha chains and two gamma chains. And these gamma chains are different from the beta chains. So the gamma chains, they are different from uh, the beta chains. So this is a combination that is found within the, the fetus. So it's called fetohemoglobin. Then you have hemoglobin adult, the one that I've already explained. So the difference between hemoglobin fetus and hemoglobin adult is on one pair of polypeptide chain. So we say in a fetal hemoglobin, you have two alpha, two gamma chains. But in adult hemoglobin, you have two alpha chains and two beta chains. So you find that in an adult hemoglobin, the form formed starting at about, uh, the hemoglobin will start formed starting at about 32 to 34 uh, weeks of gestation. And this is as a result of methylation reaction. So once the gamma chain are methylated, then they will be converted into beta chains. The gamma chains, once are methylated, then they'll be converted into a beta chains. That's why in adult hemoglobin, you don't have much of the gamma chains that you have are uh, beta chains because of methylation reaction. Then the hemoglobin adult two, like I've already explained here, you have two alpha chains and two delta chains. So this, the quantity of hemoglobin two will start increasing after birth. You don't have much of it, but uh, the quantity that you can appreciate to appear in the blood after birth. Why? It's because this hemoglobin adult two will, will be present in a mature fetus, but after birth, that's when the, the quantity will increase. So there is another diagram to summarize that for you to appreciate. So this diagram is just trying to summarize what I've been discussing with you. So I hope you are following. So you have um, this diagram that is showing different types of hemoglobin that can be found in an individual depending on the age. During embryo development, you have much of the yolk sac that is involved in uh, production of blood cells or which is active with regard to hematopoiesis. So the yolk sac is the one that is producing uh, red blood cells and other blood cells. <clears throat> so within these red blood cells, the type of hemoglobin is different. So within the embryo, the majority of the hemoglobin that you're going to find there is with this combination. You have two zeta and two epsilon polypeptide chains. But within the yolk sac also, you can also have a combination of the two alpha and two epsilon. So you have, I come again, a combination of polypeptide chains composed of two zeta and two epsilon, which is called the GOA1 hemoglobin. Then you also have the GOA2 hemoglobin that is composed of two alpha and two epsilon. So those are the two types of hemoglobin that are dominant in an embryo. Then as the embryo develops into a fetus, the hemoglobin type will start changing. So now you're going to have more of two alpha and two gamma chains. So two alpha and two gamma chains. So you have the fetohemoglobin with that combination, two alpha, two gamma chains. Then within the fetus, you can also have adult hemoglobin within the fetus. In this adult hemoglobin, you have two alpha and two beta chains. But in terms of quantity, you have more of the fetohemoglobin in these red blood cells. Then as you have almost approaching birth, after birth, there's a swap in terms of these polypeptide chains. So like I said, in adult hemoglobin, the dominant one is two alpha, two beta chains. Why? It's because after birth, there is a lot of methylation of the gamma polypeptide chain. So after methylation reaction of the gamma, 
polypeptide chain, it will be converted into the beta chain. So hence, we have an increase in the beta chain. So the adult hemoglobin will have two alpha, two beta. Then you can see here after birth, there is another polypeptide chain that is appearing here. It's called delta. That is more prominent in adult. So there's another hemoglobin that is found in an adult. It's called adult hemoglobin 2. This adult hemoglobin 2 is composed of 2 alpha and 2 delta. This 2 alpha, 2 delta is not very good at uh, combining with oxygen or transporting of oxygen. So hence, it can't reach saturation. That's the reason why blood will never reach 100% uh, saturation because of these impurities when you're talking of the structure of hemoglobin. So different type of hemoglobin, they'll have different affinity towards, um, towards oxygen. So I hope that helps Let's proceed. <clears throat> so just a bit of information. Let's look at the transport of oxygen in, in the blood. So mainly we're looking at the function of red blood cells. So in as much as I'm generalizing this to say transport of oxygen in blood, but I'm more interested in the function of the red blood cell itself in the transportation of oxygen. Okay, so 95% of oxygen is transported bound with hemoglobin molecules. So 95% of oxygen after gaseous exchange in the lungs will combine with adult hemoglobin for transportation. Then you have 2% of oxygen that will dissolve and will be transported in plasma. So 2% of oxygen is transported as dissolved oxygen in plasma. So this is a general function of blood, blood in terms with regard to transportation of oxygen, but I'm interested with this 98% that will bind with the hemoglobin because the hemoglobin is part of red blood cell structure. So this hemoglobin is composed or is found within red blood cell. So this information I've already shared with you. So these are just extra notes for you to go and read on. Okay, so we proceed. <clears throat> so now let's look at transport of carbon dioxide in the blood. So how is carbon dioxide transported? For oxygen, we've already seen it will combine with the heme group or the hemoglobin. Then it can never reach 100% saturation because you have different types of hemoglobin. You have adult hemoglobin A, you have adult hemoglobin A2 that do not interact with oxygen that much. So the, the affinity is not strong. Because of that, it can't carry the oxygen. Then the 98% of oxygen after gases exchange is the one that is binding with the hemoglobin for the transportation. The 2% will dissolve in plasma, so it will be transported as dissolved oxygen in plasma. So now let's move on to the carbon dioxide. How is it transported in blood? So like I said, this component will be discussed again when we start looking at uh, respiratory system. So for now, we'll just highlight on certain points that you need to know. Carbon dioxide may be transported in the blood in different forms, just like oxygen. So there are three major forms in which carbon dioxide will be transported in the blood. So you have carbon dioxide that is dissolving in plasma. So you have dissolving carbon dioxide in plasma is about 7%. So it will be transported as dissolved carbon dioxide in plasma, 7%. Then you have the 23% of carbon dioxide that is binding with the hemoglobin. But here, it suffice to mention again that the carbon dioxide is not binding to the same site as oxygen. Oxygen binds to the heme. The carbon dioxide, the 23% of carbon dioxide will go and bind to the globin part of the hemoglobin. So it's binding to the globin part of the hemoglobin. And this combination of the globin plus carbon dioxide, it's called carbamino hemoglobin. So you have carbamino hemoglobin or carbamino compounds 
whereby they go in bind to the globulin. So if carbon dioxide is binding, it's called carbaminohemoglobin. So this carbaminohemoglobin will be transported to the lungs. Then it will release the carbon dioxide to the lungs for gaseous exchange. So you can see the reaction down here that the hemoglobin is reacting with carbon dioxide, giving you your carbaminohemoglobin. So this is the 23% and the 7%. If you add 23 plus 7, it will give you 30%. So it means what about the other 70%? So the 70% of carbon dioxide is transported as dissolved uh, by carbonate in plasma. So some of this carbon dioxide, it will enter the red blood cell. It will undergo a reaction by the help of carbonic anhydrase. And this carbonic anhydrase is going to facilitate the reaction. Carbon dioxide will react with water, giving you carbonic acid. That carbonic acid is very unstable, so it will dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. The bicarbonate will be transported by plasma. So it will diffuse back into plasma then to be transported as dissolved by carbonate in plasma. So some of the carbon dioxide is indirectly being transported as bicarbonate. When it gets to the lungs, this enzyme can also catalyze a reaction that will convert the bicarbonate back to carbon dioxide. Then this carbon dioxide will be exchanged for oxygen in the lungs later on. <clears throat> this diagram is just summarizing the steps that I just explained when talking of um, transportation of carbon dioxide. So you can see carbon dioxide that is diffusing into the red blood cell. And then you have the 7% that remains within plasma. So you have dissolved carbon dioxide in plasma is transported as such, 7%. Then you have the 93% of carbon dioxide that is diffusing into the red blood cells. Once it gets into the red blood cell, the 23% of this is binding with hemoglobin. So it will bind with the hemoglobin forming carbaminohemoglobin. Then the 70% is undergoing a reaction. So 70% of carbon dioxide will be converted to bicarbonate, bicarbonic anhydrase. And this bicarbonate is unstable, so it will dissociate into hydrogen ions or protons and bicarbonates. The hydrogen ions, they have a capability of changing the pH of the cytoplasm and also blood as a whole. So these hydrogen ions will be picked up by the hemoglobin. That's why the hemoglobin is also functioning as a buffer because it can remove these hydrogen ions once they have been released from this reaction. So they will bind with the hemoglobin. Then at the same time, the bicarbonate will be exchanged for chloride. So you have this bicarbonate chloride exchanger. And this process is called chloride shift, whereby the chloride will shift into the cell in exchange for bicarbonates. And this bicarbonate will be dissolved in plasma. Then it will be transported by plasma to the lungs for exchange. But once it gets to the lungs, it needs to diffuse back into the red blood cells, then it will react with the hydrogen ions. And then once it reacts with the hydrogen ions, it will be converted into uh, carbonic acid. This carbonic acid uh, now will dissociate into water and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide will be exchanged for oxygen. So it's just a reverse reaction that is taking place within the lungs once you have transported your bicarbonate there. Okay, so enough with the, the transportation of carbon dioxide and also transportation of oxygen. Then on top of that, uh, red blood cells, they are also functioning as a buffer system to regulate the pH. Then they also contain enzymes that are able to convert the bicarbonate into carbon dioxide and also to convert the, the, the carbon dioxide into bicarbonate. So you have a reverse reaction. So you have those carbonic anhydrase. So you need to mention that. So if the question comes to say, can you list the major functions of red blood cell? So transportation of oxygen from the lungs to the tissues, transportation of carbon dioxide,
from the tissues, the lungs, then the red blood cell, they also help in regulating the pH, so regulation of pH by the hemoglobin cells. Then they also contain enzymes. And these enzymes are capable of converting carbon dioxide to bicarbonates or converting bicarbonates to carbon dioxide. So you need to mention all that. <clears throat> so now you know the functions of red blood cells. The next thing you need to know how to do red cell count. So red cell count is also called erythrocyte count. So there are different reasons why you would want to do red cell count. For instance, you are having a patient who is so weak, maybe they have a challenge with breathing, you know, they have episodes of fainting, all that is pointing to a function of red blood cell. So you'd want to carry out a red cell count to know whether this patient have enough red blood cells or less, so that it also helps you as a doctor to come up with definitive diagnosis. So you have differential diagnosis, and now you want to come up with a definitive diagnosis, you need to carry out certain tests. So red blood cell count is a blood test that you carry out to ascertain the number of red blood cells. And then on top of that, it's also going to give you information or data that you can use to calculate blood indices. So you also need blood indices because blood indices will give you information about the size, the shape of red blood cell and also the oxygen content within this red blood cell. So you need that information for you to come up with a definitive diagnosis of different types of anemias that we'll be discussing later on. And the other reason why you want to do red blood cell count, sometimes you just want to do a health screening. You just want to know if this person is fit or not, or whether they have sickle cell or not. Then on top of that, there are certain drugs that can induce hemolysis. So once you're using drug-induced hemolysis, especially NSAID drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs that can cause hemolysis, you need to, to check how the patient is responding to the treatment. So you'd want to do red blood cell count to know if the patient is responding well to, red, uh, to certain drugs or maybe there are these side effects. So you just want to do that. So there are two different methods that you can use to count uh, red blood cells. So you have automated method. So automated method, you're using a machine. So it's electronic electronic hematology cell counter. It's a machine that you use, which is also called CUTA. So this CUTA, it's a machine whereby you just collect blood sample, whole blood sample from a patient or whoever you want to count the red blood cell. Then you put in this machine. This machine will be able to do the counting for you. So it will give you absolute values for red blood cell, white blood cell, and blood indices. So you have all the information to help you to come up with a, a diagnosis if there's a disease. So this one comes handy because you don't waste time. You just put your sample in there. Then in no time, it will give you the result. But the manual one, which is very cumbersome and to some extent is less accurate because you're using your eyes to count the cell. So sometimes you can miss a cell as you are counting. So it's not as accurate as the automated one. But as a medical student, you need to understand the manual method because this is a hands-on, hands-on so that you appreciate how it's done. So in as much as we have these automated machines that can count red blood cell for us, we we'll just emphasize that you familiarize yourself with also the manual method of counting red blood cell. For instance, you are posted to a rural area where this machine is not working. You don't have to wait for the government to fund that hospital to buy equipment if you have the microscope and uh, you can easily buy the diluting fluids or you can make it yourself uh, from normal saline with a combination of uh, sodium chloride and, diluted, uh, and distilled water. So you can simply do that. So you don't have to, to wait until you have the automated um, machine for you to do red blood cell count. So now let's go into the manual one because this is 
quite interesting for you as a medical doctor. It's very important. So this manual, you have you are using visual microscope to view the red blood cell and to count them. So you have a counting chamber. So you have a uh, a, a, a special slide which is called improved new bar slide or chamber slide <clears throat> that is used for counting blood cells in general. It's also called hemocytometer. So the hemocytometer, it comes as a kit. So there's a hemocytometer kit where you have the pipettes for white blood cells. You also have a pipette for red blood cell. And on top of that, you have the improved new bar slides that you're going to use to count red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. <clears throat> So we proceed. So let's look at the principle of erythrocyte count. The principle behind erythrocyte count. So in order to facilitate red blood cell count, a specified volume of blood is diluted with a specified volume of isotonic fluid. So you need this diluting fluid that has to be isotonic. And remember, when we're looking at tonicity of solutions, we had hypertonic solution, isotonic solution, and hypotonic solution. Hypertonic solution, isotonic solution, and hypotonic solution. So the isotonic solution, the osmolality of this solution is same to the osmolality of plasma to the sense that if you put cells in isotonic solution, you don't expect a net movement of fluids from the solution into the cells or from the cells into the solution. So I'm saying there'll be no net movement of fluids, meaning that there could be some movement of fluids that are moving from the solution to the cells and then from the cells to the solution. But this movement is equal and opposite. So what is moving into the cell is the same amount what is leaving the cells. So there is no net movement of fluid. So in such a fluid, the cell will maintain its shape and size. So it won't become smaller, it won't shrink. Why? It's because you're not losing water from the cell to the solution. Neither are you gaining uh, fluids from the solution into the cell for it to become bigger. So the cell will maintain its shape. That's why you use isotonic fluid for diluting red blood cell for the purpose of counting. But why do you want to dilute the red blood cell? Remember the whole blood contains a lot of cells. You're talking of millions of cells per microliter of blood. So if you just get a microliter of blood or a drop of blood, whole blood without diluting it, and then you want to count cells under microscope, you won't be able to count them. Why is because the red blood cell, they have a tendency of sticking to one another. They will form a stack of cells, which is called Rolex formation. So that stack of red blood cell, you won't be able to count them because there are just too many of them, even as much as you are appreciating them under a microscope, but you can't separate them for you to be able to count them. So the ideal thing is you dilute them. After diluting them, then it means you space them. So once they are spaced, suspended in that uh, dilution fluid, then you'll be able to count them under microscope. Then you just take advantage of the diluting factor that you used for you to come up with the actual concentration once you finish counting the cells. So it's that simple. So there are two different types of fluid that you can use. There is isotonic saline. This isotonic saline is composed of 0.85% of sodium chloride in distilled water. So you just add 0.85% of sodium chloride in distilled water. Then you have isotonic saline, normal saline, isotonic uh, saline <clears throat> that you can use to dilute the red blood cell for you to count them. Then you also have Hayen's solution. This Hayen's solution is a combination of uh, these substances. You have sodium sulfate, sodium chloride, mercury chloride and distilled water. So you combine these, you have solutions that you can use to dilute 
your whole blood so that you are able to count. The hemocytometer, you can see here, the hemocytometer is used for manual method to count red blood cells. The one that we normally use is the improved NUBA chamber. So this improved NUBA chamber is a special type of a slide that will contain grids that you can use to count red blood cells. So when you check at the center of the improved NUBA chamber, you have the H-shaped lines in silver separating two portions. So you can see the H shaped in silver here. Then you have this dark portion and the other dark portion that is separated by this part of the H. So these dark portions, you can see at the center, you can see some structure which looks like a plus or a cross. So you can see even here, this is where you do your counting of blood cells. So there are portions where you can count red blood cell, there are portions where you can count white blood cells and platelets. So I'll explain that. So you need this improved new blood chamber for you to count blood cells. On top of that, I told you to say the hemocytometer, it comes as a kit. So in that kit, you also have pipettes. So you have a pipette for red blood cell, then you also have a pipette for white blood cell. So the pipette for the red blood cell is different from that of the white blood cell. As you can see, the mouthpiece here, for the red blood cell, it's red. For the white blood cell, it's white. Then when you check the bulb here, the bulb for the red blood cell, it's bigger, and the bulb for the pipette of white blood cell is smaller. When you check inside the bulb, you have a bead structure, a bead. So the bead that is found within the pipette of red blood cell, it's red. That of white blood cell, it's white. You can't appreciate it here because of the contrast. It's also white. Then the calibrations. The calibrations are also different. That of red blood cell, you have three marks that you can appreciate. You have 0 0.5 mark, 1 mark, and 101 mark, which is different from the white blood cell. Okay. So if you don't understand this, I'll still summarize this in a table so that you appreciate more. So I'm just differentiating the red blood cell pipette from white blood cell pipette. Why is it important for you to differentiate the two? Because sometimes you can come for a practical exam, then we'll ask you to do red blood cell count, but we're not going to separate. We're not going to give you the red blood cell pipette alone. We'll give you both the red blood cell pipette and white blood cell pipette, the whole kit. So some students, I don't know, for the lack of better term, they are foolish enough not to differentiate the two. You find you ask them to do red, red blood cell count, they are using a pipette for white blood cell. Then you get it all wrong when you're looking at the dilution factors there, because the amount of the diluting fluid is different for white blood cell and red blood cell. So how do we differentiate them? Like I've already said, we are going through it again for the sake of understanding. So let's start. The first one, the red blood cell pipette, it has a red bead inside the bulb. White blood cell, it has a white bead inside the bulb. Red blood cell pipette, it has marked major calibrations of 0 0.5, 1.0, and 101. That of white blood cell, it has got major calibrations, calibra calibrations of 0 0.5, 1, and 11. Then the size of the bulb. Red blood cell pipette has got a larger bulb as compared to white blood cell pipette. Then the size of the lumen is smaller or the capillary bore lumen is narrow. Thus, it has slow speed pipette. So it is a slow speed pipette. So when you're talking of red blood cell pipette, the lumen is smaller. So the amount of fluid that you can aspirate per time is not as much as the white blood cell. Why? It's because the lumen is smaller. 
so it's also referred to as a slow speed pipette. That of white blood cell, the lumen is larger and the capillary ball lumen is also wider. So it is also referred to as a fast speed pipette. So you can aspirate larger volume of fluid per minute or per unit time as compared to that of red blood cell pipette. The mouthpiece for red blood cell pipette, it's red in color. That of white blood cell is white in color. The dilution can be done up to 100 to 200 times in red blood cell pipette. But for white blood cell pipette, the dilution can only be done up to 10 or 20 times. That's why even the bulb for the red blood cell pipette is larger. So it can accommodate much diluting fluid as compared to that of white blood cell. So now you know how to differentiate. So we go on to understand the new bar slide, the special slide. But before we start looking at the new bar slide, let's look at the actual procedure that is involved in blood cell count. So these procedures, there are variations depending on the lab you are using, the lecturers, but they will all point to the same thing. You're going to achieve the same thing at the end, but you can have some minor differences when you're looking at the procedure from one lab to another lab, or from one lecturer to another lecturer, one lab scientist to another lab scientist. So now let's look at the procedure. So the first thing that you need, you need to assemble all the equipment that you need to do your red cell count. So you need the diluting fluid, the HM solution, or the isotonic saline solution that you're going to use for diluting. You also need a um, hemocytometer. So part of that hemocytometer, you have the, uh, the pipettes, the pipettes for red blood cell in this case, then you're also going to have the Nuba chamber, the improved Nuba chamber. Then you also need the microscope for you to be able to count the cells. So these are the equipments that you need. And sometimes you can also add a counter that you use to count red blood cells. So as you are counting manually, you are just pressing that counter, then it will give you the recording of the total blood cells that you are going to count. So as you are seeing here, then you're just pressing that. So you find that it will tell the number of cells that you're going to count on the slide and what you're going to, to record on the counter. So after you have the equipment, you draw the blood directly from the finger or collected sample in the red blood cell pipette up to 0 0.5 max. So you draw or you aspirate blood. So first you prick your finger, when you prick your finger, there's blood, you can use a lacent to prick yourself or a small needle, you prick yourself, then you squeeze the blood out, then you get the prepared for the red blood cell, then you aspirate. So you draw or you aspirate up to 0 0.5 mark, then you stop. Then after that, you wipe off the tip of the pipette to remove extra blood if present. So sometimes there could be some blood that is remaining on the tip. So you can use a tissue or cotton, you just wipe off the blood. Then from there, that's when you are going to introduce your diluting fluid now. So then immediately draw up the diluting fluid, the HM solution up to 101 mark. So you aspirate again. So there's blood first. Then you aspirate the fluid, the HM fluid solution up to 101 mark. Then you stop. After that, you gently mix the blood and the diluting solution. So then you rotate the pipette gently for two to three minutes so that the diluting fluid get mixed properly with the blood. When you do that, you have the dilution factor of one to 200. So you have a dilution factor of 200, one to 200, meaning that you've diluted your blood 200 times the normal whole blood. 
So you've separated these cells 200 times, in other words, you've separated them 200 times from one cell to another cell. By so doing, they will be suspended nicely, then you'll be able to count them. Then before you charge the new bar improved chamber, you need to, to place your cover slip in position over the root area of the chamber. So you put the cover slip on top of the chamber. So for the cover slip to stick on the new bar chamber, you can put a bit of saliva on the edges of the cover slip so that it sticks on top, or you can use methylated spirit. You just put on the edges, then it will stick on top. And then after that, you charge the nubia chamber with the mixture or your diluted blood to avoid bubble formation. So you need to be gentle so that you don't create bubbles because once you create bubbles, it will interfere with the surface area that you're going to count your blood cell because where you're supposed to have cells, you're going to have a bubble. So that will interfere with your results. So you don't want to have bubbles in there. And then you view under microscope at magnification of 10. So you start with the low power. So low power magnification, magnification of 10 times 10. You focus your new bar chamber so that you see the squares where you're supposed to read or to, to count the red blood cell. Then after that, you change to a magnification of to a magnification of 40, then you'll be able to appreciate the, the red blood cell. Then you'll be able to count them. Okay, so this is the improved new bar chamber. Like I said, you have these lines, the silver lines that will form like an H. So you can see here, this is an H. So this H, you have this portion where you can use for counting your blood cells and this portion where you can use for counting blood cells. So for every sample that you, that you charge the new blood chamber with, you can have two results. You can have this portion, in this portion. So you can get the average of the two results, but like I said, you don't have much time. So you find that you just count on one because it's cumbersome and it takes time for you to count each and every red blood cell. So sometimes you just do one, but the idea is that you count on two and then you get the average of the two numbers, then you do your calculations. <clears throat> so when you expand here, when you expand on this portion here, you can see the squares here. So these are the squares. So you have nine bigger squares. Out of these nine bigger squares, there are four squares at the corners. These uh, squares at the corners, these are the ones that you use for white blood cell. But at the center here, this is where you use for red blood cells. So the squares for the white blood cells, when you check inside, you have small squares. So each bigger square, it contains about four Four times four, it will contain about 16 squares. So you have one, two, three, four small squares. One, two, three, four so squares. So four multiplied by four, it will give you 16. So they, for the white blood cells, they contain 16 small squares inside, which is different for the red blood cell. For you to, to locate the, the, the square for the red blood cell, you need to look at this plus sign. So you can appreciate the cross here or the plus sign. And at the center of the plus sign, this is where you find red blood cells. Okay, just at the center of the cross here. This is where you find the square for counting red blood cells. So this square is different from the white blood cells. Why is because this square, it has got 25 small squares instead of 16. So you have one, two, three, four, five, this side. One, two, three, four, five, this side. Five times five, it will give you 25. So there are 25 small squares inside. But you don't count on all the 25 small squares. So there are selected five squares where you're going to do your counting. So red blood cell are only counted on the five out of the 25 squares that are inside the portion for red blood cell. So which squares do you count? So you count the squares at the four corners. So you have the four corners of this big square. You have these small squares. So you have this one, that one, that one, and that one. So this is where you count. So you have one, two, three, four. 
then you count the one at the center of the square. If this is confusing, then this slide will help. So you can see here that you have the four small squares at the center here. So this one, this is the bigger square that you use for the red blood cell. Like I said, inside you have 25 squares. Out of those 25 squares, we are only going to select five squares where you're going to do the counting of red blood cells. So you have this one at this corner, then this one, so you have one, two, three, four, five. So as you are counting, you can start with this one here. You count all the cells in that box. Then I'll give you the landmarks on how you're going to count them. Then you go this way, one, two, three, four, five. Then you count on this one. Then you go down, you count in this one. Then you go this side, you count in this one. Then you go at the center here, you count. So the total number of cells counted, you're going to add them. Then you're going to factor in the dilution factor, the depth in the area for you to calculate the overall red blood cell count. Okay. So like I said here, you can now expand on one of the squares. So you have these five squares for red blood cells. So now when you expand on one square, what are you going to appreciate? So this one square, when you expand, when you check inside, you're also going to find 16 small squares inside this big square. So the 16 here, this is where you're going to do your counting of red blood cell. So we're just looking at one of these big square here. Inside you have 16 small squares. So there are rules that you need to apply for you to count. So you don't just count anyhow. So depending on the lab, it's either you count all the cells that are touching the top line of this bigger square, then the left line or margin, the left margin of this bigger square. You don't count those cells that are just touching the bottom line and the margin on the right. So it's, it's either you count the top and the left margin, or you count the bottom and the right margin. You don't count all the cells touching these margins here. I hope you understand. So in this case, if you're just counting those cells touching the top margin and the left margin, then all the cells touching that line, you count them. So you start. So when you check this margin, it has got three tiny lines. You can see these three tiny margins here, forming the bigger margin for this bigger uh, square. This line here, when you magnify, you're going to see three small lines. So the line that you're going to use as your reference as you are counting is the middle line here. So all the cells that are touching the middle line, you count them. So on this margin, you can see this cell is touching the middle line. So you count it one. Even this one, two. That one, four. That one, five. That one, six. That one, seven. This one on top here, yes, is almost touching the margin, but it's not touching the middle line here. So you don't count it, you leave it out. Same applies to that one. You don't count it, you leave it out. This side, all the cells touching this line, you ignore them. Then you count all the cells inside these small squares. So you go square by square. You start with this one, you go to that one in that direction. Then you come down, you count like that. Then you come down, you count sideways, just like that until you complete the total number of red blood cell in this square. You record somewhere. You do the same for this square, that one, that one, that one. Then you add, then you do your calculations. So you can see here, these are your calculations. So your red cell count will be the number of cell counted 
multiplied by the dilution factor, multiplied by the depth, multiplied by the area counted. So you have your dilution factor is 200, and then you have your depth here. Then you multiply it by the area that you've counted. One, two, three, four, five. Then when you do those multiplications, the product that you're going to find is the total number of red blood cells. So you have factor in the dilution so that now you're converting to the actual number of cells in whole blood before dilution. That's why you're multiplying with the diluting factor. So for this particular example, if you count, for instance, on average, you count 100 cells here, 100, 100, 100, 100. So you're going to have 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100, or 100 multiplied by 5, it will give you 500. 500 multiplied by 200 multiplied by 10 multiplied by 5, it will give you 5,000 red blood cells per cubic millimeter of blood, or per microliter of blood. You have 5,000. This is the normal case. But in normal circumstances, when you come for practical exams, we are not going to give you a normal case. Or even if I give you a clinical scenario case in an exam, theory exam, don't expect me to give you normal values. Maybe, yeah, sometimes I can. But in most cases, I'll give you abnormal values. It's either you have an increase in red blood cell or you have a decrease so that you are able to come up with a diagnosis. So if you do this, then you'll be able to come up with a diagnosis. Okay, so this video is just summarizing, just a small illustration in the lab. This is what will happen. How do you count? Total count of red blood cell corpuscles. So it's just a short video for about two minutes or three, just for you to appreciate the cells. So let's start. So the requirements that you need, that's the first thing. So what requirements do you need? The reaching fluid. You also need uh, a chamber where you're going to pour your diluting fluid so that you, you are able to aspirate. Then you prick your finger with a lacent. You squeeze the blood out. Then you aspirate blood up to 0 0.5 mark. Then you aspirate your diluting fluid up to 0 0.1 mark. When you do that, you mix blood in red blood cell counting fluid for about three to five minutes, gently. Gently. Then when you do that, you discard. You discard the initial two drops of this dilution fluid so that you have the normal proportion where you have well diluted red blood cell as you are uh, charging the new blood chamber. So you introduce the diluted fluid in the hemocytometer gently so that you avoid creating bubbles. Because once you have bubbles there, they will interfere with your readings or your results. So you load on one side, and then you also load on the other side. Then you, you replicate the results because you count this side and the other side. So you'll be able to tell. So you adjust the slide. You adjust your microscope so that you view where you're going to do your counting. So you have the five boxes or five squares where you do red blood cell count. So you can see the squares on the corners, the four cornered squared then you also count the middle square. So these are how the red blood cells will be looking. So you can see the red blood cells here after the addition, you are able to count them. Okay, so even here you can appreciate. So you are able to count red blood cell. So for instance, if here you count 112, 101, 99, 98, and 116, you add these cells that you've counted from the five squares then you come back to your calculations. So after adding, you have the total number of red blood cells that you have counted in five squares, then you factor in your dilution uh, factor and also the area and the depth. Then you'll be able 
to calculate the red blood cell count, the total red blood cell count. So under normal circumstances, adults they have more red blood cells as compared to females. In adult females, it's less, 4.5 to 5.5 million. In, uh, in males, it's small. It's about five to six million red blood cell per cubic millimeter of blood or per microliter of blood. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to look at is blood indices. So we have blood indices. So these are the last things that we're going to discuss. And then we'll end this class. So blood indices, we start. So what are blood indices? So how can you define blood indices? So these blood indices, Red blood cell indices are blood tests that will provide information about the hemoglobin content, how much hemoglobin do these cells have, the red blood cells. And you're also looking at the size of red blood cells. Are they big, are they small? So when you have your blood indices well calculated, they will give you the information about the hemoglobin content and the size of red blood cells. So when you're talking of hemoglobin content, that will point to the color of red blood cells. So if they have normal hemoglobin content, then that cell is called normochromic. So it's normochromic because the color is normal. So it's normochromic. If you have an increase in hemoglobin content, then it will be hyperchromic. If you have a decrease in hemoglobin content, then you have hypochromic cells. In terms of the size of red blood cells, you're looking at the volume, the volume of red blood cell. So whether you have an increase in the size or the volume of red blood cell, or you have a decrease, or you have the normal size. So if you have a normal size of red blood cells, it's called normocytic. So they are normocytic, normal cells, normocytic. If you have an increase in the size, then they are called macrocytic, macro, macrocytic. If you have a decrease in red blood cell size, then they are called microcytic. So macrocytic and micro. Macro is an increase in size. Micro is a decrease in size. Normal size, they are called normocytic cells. So using this, you are able to come up with a definitive diagnosis of anemia. For instance, you can have a hypochromic microcytic anemia. In case of iron deficiency anemia, the cells are small. And then on top of that, the content of hemoglobin is not that much because for the uh, production of hemoglobin, you need iron. So if you're lacking iron, there is, there is less hemoglobin that will be produced in iron deficiency anemia. So you're going to have more of small cells, which are called microcytic. Then they will have abnormal color, and this color is less or reduced color density. So it's called hypochromic. So hypochromic microcytic anemia. So you are able to come up with the definitive diagnosis for anemia so that you know which type of anemia is affecting this patient. So you can use the indices. So that brings us to the importance of blood indices. So the blood indices have diagnostic value in determining the type of anemia, like I said what type of anemia. By looking at the blood indices, you'll be able to tell that. So there are four blood indices that we are going to discuss. So we have mean corpuscular volume, MCH, mean corpuscular volume. And then we have mean corpuscular hemoglobin, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, MCH. Then we have mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, MCHC. Then the last one is called the color index. So the last one is the color index. So how can you use these parameters or blood indices for you to come up with a diagnosis, a definitive diagnosis of anemia? <clears throat> okay. So how do you calculate the blood indices? So let's look at the significance of these blood indices and how you can calculate them. So each 
index that you're going to use. How can you calculate it? And what does that tell you? So let's start. So in general, blood indices are calculated by using different formula. So you have different formula for each and every blood index, index or indices. So these calculations will require values of red blood cell count, hemoglobin content, and PCV. So for you to do these calculations, you need this information. You need to know the red cell count for this patient. You also need to know the hemoglobin content for this patient. You also need to know packed cell volume, which is also called the hematocrit or PCV for this patient. Once you have this information, you'll be able to calculate blood indices. But when you're using automated machines, they will, they will calculate on their own. And then they will just give you absolute values for blood indices. And then from there, you're able to come up with a diagnosis. So for example, let's just give us ourselves a male subject with this data to be used to come up with the calculations for blood indices. So this male subject, he has got red blood cell count of 4 million cells per microliter of blood or cubic millimeter of blood. Remember, you've done your total blood cell count and then you come up with this figure of 4 million cells per cubic millimeter. And then the hemoglobin content, let's say it's 8%, but remember that this hemoglobin content sometimes is given in grams per deciliter. So sometimes it can be given as a percentage or in grams per deciliter. So it's just basically one and the same thing. So under normal circumstances, you know that on average, the normal hemat uh, hemoglobin content should be between 14 to about 16, depending on the sex again. So males, they have more hemoglobin content as compared to females. So in males, it's more, females is less. So on average, a normal person should have a hemo, um, hemoglobin content of about 15 or 15%. Packed cell volume. So packed cell volume is different from hemoglobin content. Packed cell volume is the hematocrit. And this hematocrit, is the fraction of the whole blood that is occupied by blood cells. So that component of whole blood that is occupied by blood cells is called hematocrit. So for this particular subject, let's say the PCV is 30%. So let's start with the calculations, but first let's look at each and every uh, index or blood indices, what does it entail before you go to the calculation? So we start with mean corpuscular volume. You need to follow here because sometimes it can be confusing, but it's really very simple if you pay attention. So we are starting with MCV. So from the name itself, you should be able to define these blood indices. So mean corpuscular volume, you're talking of the volume the corpuscular, you're talking of the cells themselves, the corpuscles, the red corpuscles or red blood cells or erythrocytes. So the mean corpuscular volume, you are simply looking at the average volume of a single red blood cell. So what is the average volume of the single red blood cell? Then you're looking at mean corpuscular volume. So out of these red blood cells that you have counted, what is the average size for these cells? So you're looking at mean corpuscular volume. That's the mean corpuscular volume. So what does it entail you? In terms of units, it's expressed in cubic microns. Sometimes it's also expressed in form of femtoliters. So you can use cubic microns as unit or femtoliters. So remember, these units, you really need to apply them when you are doing these calculations because they can cost you max if you don't put them. So mean corpuscular volume, you're looking at the average volume of a single red blood cell. They are expressed in cubic microns or femtoliters. On average, the normal mean corpuscular volume should be around 90 cubic microns or 78 
to 90, that's a range, 78 to 90 cubic microns. So depending on the, uh, the textbook you're using, other textbooks, they'll give you about 78 to 94 cubic microns or femtoliter. Okay, so this is just a normal range. So anything outside this range, then you'll be able to come up with a diagnosis. So when the MCV is increased, the cell is referred to as macrocyte. So if the MCV is increased, the average volume of these single red blood cells have increased, then those cells are bigger than normal. So they are called macrocyte, a macrocyte, a bigger cell, macro. Then when the MCV is decreased, then the cells are referred to as microcyte. A microcyte, it's a small cell. So macrocyte, larger red blood cells. Microcyte, smaller red blood cells. So depending on the conditions. So MCV is increased in pernicious anemia and megaloblastic anemia, in which the red blood cells are microcytic in nature. So like I said, tomorrow we'll also be looking at these types, different types of anemia. So pernicious anemia is a, it's a type of anemia in which a patient is lacking vitamin B12. Why? Sometimes it's due to lack of the intrinsic factor. So within the gastric pits in the stomach, there is uh, parietal cells that are responsible for the production of um, production of intrinsic factor. So if those cells are damaged, or when you undergo surgery and then part of the stomach is removed, then you don't have much of these parietal cells produce intrinsic factor. Even the absorption of vitamin B12 will reduce. So if you lack vitamin B12, most likely you suffer from pernicious anemia. Remember, vitamin B12 is required for the uh, production of DNA. So it's involved, in, it's involved in maturation of red blood cells. So without that, the red blood cell won't mature. If they are not mat maturing, then they'll become bigger because they can't mature. Remember, during erythropoiesis, the cells, there is change in size. So as they are developing, there is a decrease in size. So if these cells are not maturing, you find that they will maintain bigger size. So they will be more of macrocytic. Then, like I said, when the MCV is less, then this is referred to as microcytic anemia, microcytic anemia as opposed to macrocytic nature of anemia. So how do you calculate the mean corpuscular volume? So this is the data that we've been given. Our subject, red blood cell count, 4 million cells per microliter of blood or cubic millimeter of blood, hemoglobin content, 8% or 8 grams per deciliter, and then PCV hematocrit, 30%. So this is the formula for MCV. You need to understand this formula. If you don't understand, you just need to memorize it. So MCV is calculated as the volume of packed cells. That is your hematocrit. So your PCV multiplied by 10 divided by red cell count. So that's your formula for MCV. Hematocrit multiplied by 10 divided by red cell count. So with this data that we've been given, the packed cell volume or hematocrit is 30% multiplied by 10 divided by your red cell count is 4. So it will give you a total of 75 cubic microns or pentoliter. So when you compare these to the normal, we say the normal range is 78 to 90 cubic microns or pentoliter. So this is outside the range. So you need to know, is it increased or decreased? Depending on the normal range, you can see here that it's decreased. So because it's decreased, it means that the size are smaller. The average size of each red blood cell is smaller compared to the normal one. So they are microcytic. So this kind of anemia is going towards microcytic, but you still need to calculate for the other indices for you to come up with a definitive diagnosis. So far, we know to say it's microcytic. So we proceed to the next uh, index. So the next index of blood 
or blood indices. It's mean corpuscular hemoglobin. So how do you define the mean corpuscular hemoglobin is just the quantity or the amount of hemoglobin present in one red cell. So when you get one erythrocytes, then you check the amount or the quantity of hemoglobin in there, then you are calculating mean corpuscular hemoglobin. Mean corpuscular hemoglobin is simply the quantity or the amount of hemoglobin present in one red blood cell. So how much of hemoglobin do you have in each red blood cell? In terms of units, they are expressed in micro micrograms or picograms. The normal range, so in a normal person on average should have 30 picograms, but the normal range, the accepted range is between 27 to 32 picograms. So anything outside this range, then you have decrease in terms of the quantity of hemoglobin in red blood cell or an increase. So how do you differentiate them is by looking at the color of red blood cell. So those with uh, a decrease, <clears throat> they are called hypochromic. Those with an increase, hyperchromic. Those with a normal quantity of hemoglobin, they are referred to as normochromic. You're talking of the color. So it decreases or remains normal in pernicious anemia and megaloblastic anemia, in which the red blood cells are macrocytic, normochromic, and hypochromic. But like I said, how do you differentiate them if you have an, a decrease in hemoglobin concentration or the amount of hemoglobin in these red blood cells? Those cells are referred to as hypochromic. So this type of anemia will be hypochromic anemia. If you have an increase, then it's hyperchromic anemia. If it's the normal amount of hemoglobin in each red blood cell, then they are called normochromic states. So you don't have anemia there in terms of, I mean, in terms of color, it's normal color. So it's normochromic. You're having enough red blood uh, hemoglobin in these red blood cells. How do you calculate the mean corpuscular hemoglobin? So MCH, the data that we are given, red blood cell count, 4 million, red blood cell per microliter of blood, hemoglobin content, 8% or 8 grams per deciliter, then the packed cell volume or the hematocrit, 30%. So how do you calculate? So this is the formula for mean corpuscular hemoglobin. So the amount of hemoglobin in each red blood cell, how do you calculate them? So the mean corpuscular hemoglobin is equal to the hemoglobin content multiplied by 10 divided by red cell count. So once you have your hemoglobin content and red cell count, you'll be able to calculate MCH. So your hemoglobin content is 8% or eight grams per deciliter. So eight multiplied by 10 to give you 80. Your red blood cell count here is four. So eight divided by four to give you 20. So 20 picograms, don't forget the units, 20 picograms. So we compare it to the normal, is it increasing or decreasing? Or is it within the normal range? So the normal range is between 27 to 32 picogram. So if you have 20, it means that you have reduced MCH, right? So if you have reduced MCH, then it means that your cells are hypochromic, you're looking at the color. So the amount of hemoglobin in these red blood cells have decreased, so it will become hypochromic. Then the third index of the blood indices, we have the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. So hemoglobin concentration is different from the hemoglobin content or the amount of hemoglobin. Remember the previous one, MCH, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, you're looking at the amount or the quantity of hemoglobin in each red blood cell. But here now, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration 
you're looking at the concentration of hemoglobin in one red blood cell. So the amount of hemoglobin in relation to the size of the red blood cell. If the cells are bigger, you find that the concentration will reduce. If the cells are smaller, the concentration will increase. So here you're not interested in the amount, but the concentration. So you're going to look at the relation of the, the amount of red blood cell in relation to the size of red blood cell. So it will give you the concentration. So how do you define mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration? This is the concentration of hemoglobin in one red blood cell. In other ways, it is the amount of hemoglobin expressed in relation to the volume of one red blood cell, like I said. So the units here, they are expressed in percentage form. So they are expressed in percentage form. And you need to note that this is the most important absolute value in diagnosis of anemia. This question can come in MCQs. So mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, MCHC, is the most important absolute value in the diagnosis of anemia. So if you want to do a diagnosis of anemia, to know which types of anemia, the, mess, the first parameter that you're going to look at when you use that automated machine, first go and see the MCHC, because it will give you more information about the type of anemia, whether it's increased or decreased. So the normal range should be around, on average should be around 30%, but the normal range is between 30 to 38%. So MCHC, it is increased in iron deficiency anemia in which the red blood cells are microcytic and hypochromic. Then it is decreased in hypochromic. So when it's decreased, it's hypochromic. When it's increased, it's hyperchromic. Then when it's normal, it's normochromic. So you have different types of anemia. So here, mainly you're going to look at the color of the cells, whether they are hypochromic, hyperchromic, or normochromic. But remember, this is very important when you're looking at, um, for you to come up with the definitive diagnosis of anemia as compared to the other blood indices. So how do you calculate it? There's a formula. So MCHC is equivalent to hemoglobin content multiplied by 100 divided by PCB. So if your hemoglobin content is 8% or 8 grams per deciliter, so 8 multiplied by 100, it will give you 800. Your PCB is 30 divided by 30, it will give you 26.67. So 26.67 compared to the normal range. The normal range is between 30 and 38. So 26.67 is reduced. So it's hypochromic. Then the last one that we are going to discuss is the color index. So this color index, they used to use it a long time ago, but now it's not that important but we will just discuss it anyway. You can also use it. So the color index, this is the ratio between the percentage of hemoglobin and the percentage of red blood cells in blood. So you're looking at the ratio between the percentage of hemoglobin and the percentage of red blood cells. So you need to compare the normal percentage of hemoglobin of the patient to that of a normal person then you also need to compare the hemoglobin percentage, I mean, the, the red blood cell percentage of your patient to that of the normal person. Then you use the two factors to calculate the color index. I will show you that. So in other way, the color index is actually the average hemoglobin content in one cell of the patient compared to the average hemoglobin content in one cell of the normal. So you're comparing the patient to that of the normal. So the normal range on average is one. The normal range is, the acceptable, acceptable range is 0 0.8 to 
So the color index is widely used in olden days. So it used to be used in the olden days, but however, it is useful in determining the type of anemia. So how we can also tell the type of anemia by looking at the color index. So it is raised in pernicious anemia and megaloblastic anemia. And then most cases it is reduced in iron deficiency anemia. Then it is normal in normocytic, normochromic anemia. For instance, if you have a hemorrhage, when you're losing blood as a result of an injury or an insult to the cardiovascular system, so you have a hemorrhage, so you're losing the whole blood, it means that you have anemia, but the cells will be normocytic in terms of size, and also in terms of color, they will be normochromic. So you have more of normocytic, normochromic. So you find that the, um, the color index will be normal in normocytic and normochromic anemia. That's what it means, but how can you calculate it now? So this color index is calculated by dividing the hemoglobin percentage by the red cell count percentage. So the color index is equal to the hemoglobin percentage divided by the red cell percentage. So you need to calculate the hemoglobin percentage of your patient. So how do you calculate the hemoglobin percentage of your patient? It will be equal to the hemoglobin content in the normal, uh, it will be equivalent to the hemoglobin content in the subject or the patient divided by the normal hemoglobin content times 100%. So in this case, the hemoglobin content we are given 8% and that of the normal person is 15%. So eight divided by 15 multiplied by 100, it will give you 58.3%. So this is the hemoglobin percent. So you're looking at the hemoglobin content of your subject or your patient to that of the normal person. You are comparing the two, so it's a percentage. Then you also need to calculate your red cell percentage. So your red cell percentage is calculated as the red cell count in the subject or the patient divided by the normal red cell count multiplied by 100. So in this case, we are given 4 million cells per cubic millimeter. So 4 million divided by that of the normal person, 5 million average. So 4 divided by 5, it will give you 100. Um, 4 divided by 5 times 100, it will give you 80%. So you have your hemoglobin percentage, and then you have your red cell percentage. So your color index now will be equal to the hemoglobin percentage divided by red blood cell percentage. So the hemoglobin percentage is 58.3% divided by red blood cell percentage, you calculated this 80%. When you divide the two values, it will give you 0 0.61. 0 0.61, you compare to the normal range. On average, you say it should be one. But when you compare to the normal range, the normal range is 0 0.8 to about 1.2. So 0 0.67 is reduced when you compare to the normal range. So you are also having microcytic hypochromic. So with this subject, what would be the overall results? So the overall results for this subject, the cells in terms of MCV, they are smaller, microcytic. MCH, it's less. We had 20 picograms, so it's hypochromic. MCHC, it's less. We had 26.67, which is hypochromic. And then the color index, it was also less, 0 0.67, which is microcytic hypochromic. So the tentative diagnosis now will be microcytic hypochromic anemia, which is commonly which commonly occurs during the iron deficiency. So we have iron deficiency anemia. So we are good to conclude that this person or this patient is suffering from microcytic hypochromic anemia. An example, iron deficiency anemia. So you need to check the diet of this person. Maybe you supplement iron, then you find that when you intervene now, your intervention will improve because you know specifically what is wrong with this person. So that is a, um, the, the diagnosis, how you come up with definitive diagnosis. This table is just another example that you can work on your own. 
So it will give you the, form the formulas and the values and then you are able to calculate. So you can do that on your own. Otherwise, thank you very much. Be looking forward to seeing you in another lecture. This is where lecture three of blood physiology ends.